Are you ready for an open discussion with the best of the best and the best of what's next? Welcome to the Spotlight with Tony D'Urso. Join in on a great conversation today with one of the world's great influencers as they showcase the latest tricks and techniques that made them the game changers they are today. Now, here's Tony D'Urso. Welcome to the Spotlight. I'm your host, Tony D'Urso. The Spotlight focuses on highlighting stars, greats, and game changers. We broadcast every Friday at 1 p.m. Pacific, so please... Set your calendar to hear from the world's elite. Today's Spotlight interview is with Levi King, co-founder and CEO of NAV. But first, some news for you. With over 2 million downloads on my weekly talk shows, our audience is loving our guest interviews, and I just want to say thanks a million. Or actually, thanks 2 million. And I am now on television with the Tony D'Urso TV show. Check it out at Tony D-U-R-S-O dot com slash tony tv also if you want to get some major shout outs for your business or get interviewed on tv just go to tony d-u-r-s-o dot com slash tony tv and check out the links all right today we set the stage for the spotlight to chat with levi king co-founder and ceo of nav Nav nav.com is a venture-backed company and it helps small business owners get more funding and lower their costs. Prior to NAV, Levi co-founded a business financing marketplace where he saw too many applicants get denied or only get approved for offers they couldn't afford. We all know that one, huh? Levi's columns appear regularly in publications such as Inc., Entrepreneur, and Forbes, and he's quoted in numerous news interviews. Let's find out more about this. Here we go. Welcome to the Spotlight, Levi. Thank you. I appreciate you inviting me on today. Levi, as you're well quoted as a financial authority figure, how did you become the expert you are today? What's your backstory? <laughs> I always feel silly when I, I hear myself described as an expert because I, I feel like I'm always learning. So I'm on maybe on the front side of that word, but I appreciate the description. Uh, I dropped out of college to start a manufacturing business. We manufactured electric signs, awnings, and neon and installed and serviced electric signs. Um, it was very difficult to learn. Um, I read a lot, read a lot, read a lot. Um, practiced hard and failed a lot. And that was the first of five small businesses I started. Then uh, the first tech company that you mentioned and now NAV, the second tech company. So really learned a lot along the way through self-education, good advisors, paying a lot of money to attorneys and accountants. Uh, So just good old fashioned elbow grease along the way. Some of us are no strangers to that. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that as well. And you know, I've got some questions for the entrepreneurs and business people in the Spotlight audience. Not necessarily in any particular order, but let's start here first. Can you tell us about business credit and why should we put more focus and attention on it? That's a a great question. First, I'll address why the focus and attention isn't there like it is on, on consumer credit. The federal government passed the Fair Credit Reporting Act and a few other pieces of legislation that gave consumers rights, which drew attention to uh, the topic of personal credit. And under the the, uh, permit, the Fair Credit Reporting Act, when a lender or creditor used credit data for an adverse action, meaning they didn't give someone financing, they were required by law to notify that individual that but through mail or some, some other means that data from XYZ Bureau had been used in their decision. So the federal law baked in awareness for millions of consumers over time as they started to get these notifications, which led to curiosity and and demand to see and understand, kind of take ownership of their credit data. That Fair Credit Reporting Act doesn't apply to small business, so we don't have the benefit of the the built-in system of of education that's pushed by lenders as a requirement by law. It's a shame, by the way, that small businesses aren't protected under the Fair Credit Reporting Act. We believe firmly they should be. Um, So business owners should care about their credit because, one, through the life of their business, they will need to use their credit. There's, if you want to work for the federal government as a small business or a Fortune 1000 company or even almost every state and local municipality, you have to have a certain business credit score to qualify to, to gain government contracts or big business contracts. So depending on the industry vertical you're in, it, it can hit you lots of different ways. And I, I felt that pain as a small business owner learning these things along the way myself before ever getting into the business of 
helping small business owners understand, improve, and take advantage of their, their credit data sets. Got you on that. And I've been through some of that as well with my own businesses. And I am curious, I want to make sure we find out what this is. Your, the, title, the name of your company is NAV. Is that short for anything? Does it mean navigation? Is there any history to that as well? Uh, correct. It, it is implied that it's navigation. Um, the, the philosophy behind it is that we help small business owners navigate the complex world of credit and financing over the life of their business, and it truly is a journey, and hence navigate. Um, it was a brand that we felt like played well in the nonprofit world that would feel good there, that felt good in the tech world, that felt good to small business owners. And it's kind of hard to find a brand that's easy to spell, easy to remember, one syllable, you can afford the dot com and have it play well in all circles. So, you know, we're obviously biased, but we're kind of in love with the brand. There's a cool backstory to us getting the, the domain because it's a million dollar do- domain that fortunately we were able to get at a very affordable price thanks to a small business owner. But uh, yeah, it stands for navigation, but it's implicit. I got gotcha. you. And Levi, as mentioned in the short bio that I just read, we talked about too many applicants get denied or only get approved for offers they couldn't afford. And I'd like to know, why does that happen? Is there something wrong with the system? Why are we being pushed something that we can't handle when we're, you know, I speak to so many solopreneurs, so many entrepreneurs, so many startups. Is there something wrong? Why does this happen? Yeah, that's a, another great question. So at my previous company, Lendio, um, we were, and, and they still are, a small business loan broker. And so, you know, you advertise, find people that are in market for financing, get on the phone with them, pull their credit, get their tax returns, all the things that you might need, depending on the type of financing they wanted. And, you know, hard inquiry on the consumer credit usually, uh, check the business, make sure there's no tax liens or adverse stuff there, business credit scores, depending on the type of financing. So it's kind of a moment in time underwriting. And then you shop that loan package to, to different loan brokers, or I'm sorry, different lenders and typically alternative lenders. And, and I was probably a little aggressive in how I described it. A lot of them couldn't afford the financing. Some could, but just because they could afford it didn't mean they loved it. No small business owner wants to pay a 50% APR, even if they can afford it, if they can pay a 10% APR. And so as I looked deeper into all of our data, I could see that across hundreds of thousands of applicants, about 50% of those that weren't qualified for anything because their credit data wasn't strong enough, about 50% it was realistic that with one to 12 months of work on their credit that they could get into a position to to be a subprime borrower. And of the subprime folks that were qualified for something, the work that needed to be done for about 60 to 70%, it was realistic in one to 12 months they could become a mid-prime borrower. And then in the data of the mid-prime borrowers, almost all of them could become a prime borrower with just a little bit of work. And that's where I got very passionate with my now co-founder, say, you know what, if we, if our business model is less about brokering a loan and more about credit education, then we can actually make a difference because they can, they can improve over time. So the reason that this problem exists is they don't understand their data. They don't know how a third party is going to make a risk-based decision on their business. And it's very different depending on what, who that third party is and what they have to offer. And it goes beyond financing and even to the price that you pay for your business insurance, the discount rate you pay on your merchant processing, uh, a lot of other uh, things like that where your, your credit and your business's credit is a factor in the cost that you pay as a business. So they don't understand their data. So the data is off very often just a little bit. Hence my, my call out to just one to 12 months of work. These are things that are, it's realistic you can fix. You know, if you've got a bankruptcy on your credit, it's going to be there for seven years on your personal credit or 10 years. If you have a tax lien that you didn't know about on your Dunn & Street report that's $1,000, it's going to prevent you from getting a lot of types of financing that are favorable. But if you pay it off and it's satisfied, different story. And there's thousands and thousands of examples like that in the credit data where something is just off a little bit that's, that's solvable. If you solve that or those handful of things, then you're in a position to climb up a tier. And so that, that's why the problem exists. They don't understand their data. And so they're stuck with expensive options. Got it. Enter NAV. And you may have mentioned this earlier. How long has NAV been in business again? We uh, started the process about six years ago because we have native integrations with credit bureaus and house credit data on our servers. We're regulated as a credit bureau. So this is not an easy business to get into. And there's a lot of compliance and certification requirements, as there should be, to be clear. And so we were at it for 
six months plus before we were able to go live and get our first customer. That was in 2012, and we went live and got our first couple customers just before 2013 at the end of December. And how much has NAV grown in that? How many customers have you serviced in that time period? We have almost 400,000 active customers in our direct business, and then more than that in our indirect business. So we, through advertising and partnerships and influencer networks, we get people to come directly to nav.com. That's the 400,000 that are active. There's another 20 to 25,000 that are formerly customers but churned out for one reason or another. And then in our, so think of that as B to SMB, and then we have a B to B to SMB um, distribution uh, strategy where our, our app is taken in part or in whole and inserted into other enterprises ecosystems where they have small businesses. So some small businesses interact with us and they don't even know they are um, because they it's white label or maybe it's a slight co-brand. So hundreds of thousands is the answer depending on what side of our business, but we're just getting started. We our, our vision at this company is to materially decrease the death rate of small business first in the U.S. and then other parts of the world. And so still with hundreds of thousands, while that's meaningful, if you think of a small business offer, we aspire to be in the tens of millions uh, across the globe. Great success. That's a, an astounding figure for six years of growth to have so many hundreds of thousands of customers. Really amazing here. And i like to drill in on NAV. Why is that so why is it so different? So let's drill this down. And I understand that there's software options and that you've gone through the painstaking process to, to work things out. And you're gonna, I, I would like you to explain that in your own words and how people can see what financing they can get without applying. Because that's almost like a little conundrum. Yeah, definitely. And if you think of how advanced we are now with data and technology, it is kind of astounding that we still, whether small businesses or consumers, that we still on a regular basis, way more often than not, we're applying for something we're not qualified for and we don't know that in advance, which is just kind of nuts. And so so our customers, we when they sign up, takes just a few minutes. We authenticate their personal identity, so we attach ourselves to them as an individual because we need to speak to them as an individual with biz, small business wrapped around that. Then we hit our integrations with the consumer bureaus and we pull in all that data, which is transunion and Experian. And then we, uh, they give us their business name and zip code, and with just that, we can pull in all the business credit data from Experian's business credit bureau and down to Bradstreet. We can create a FICO business score, which is used in SBA scenarios, and they can attach their business checking account, and we bring in all that data, and we model that data to give them education around that data. So in just a few minutes, we, we feed back to them education that's dynamic about personal credit, business credit, checking data, which is either close to 100% or substantial enough for us to give super high predictions around whether or not they're qualified for this business credit card, this gas card, this business loan, that line of credit. And we that certainty comes from the machine learning that we've done now for years on customers going and applying. And we see in the data if it's successful. So that's a, a, a feedback loop that never ends and just gets smarter and smarter and smarter. So that's how they can know. They, and, and it's spot on. If we tell them they have a 97% chance of being approved for a <clears throat> Chase Inc. business credit card, it's actually 97%. Why don't we know with certainty? Well, they might be on a terrorist watch list or there's these other outliers that we don't see in our data. And, and so uh, that's how they can avoid going and racking up inquiries that knock down their credit and kind of have the peace of mind and certainty in high probability of, of a positive outcome. This is The Spotlight with Tony D'Urso. Just ahead, the chat continues with Levi King, co-founder and CEO of NAV. But first, it's time for us to take a short break. See you back here in just a moment. This is the Voice America Influencers Channel. Be inspired. <laughs> 
You have a message. You want to share that message. You want it to be social, to go viral, and spread across the planet. But how do you get started? Tune in to Amplify, featuring host Ken Roshan. This show is here to help you take that message and channel it through the most effective marketing techniques to not only be successful, but have a positive impact on the world. Tune in live Monday at 8 a.m. Pacific Time and 11 a.m. Eastern Time on the Voice America Influencers Channel and get Amplified. The Voice America Live Events Channel is here now to showcase your corporate, individual, or organization's live event. Visit voiceamerica.com forward slash live events to see all of our past live events and find out more. Whether it's a multi-day conference, special speaker, or single-day event, we've got everything to make your event a success. We can do a few hours or a few days. For more information about taking your event to the next level, call Jeff Spinard at 480 294 6417 or email info at voiceamerica.com. Again, that's Jeff Spinard at 480-294-6417 or send us an email to info at voiceamerica.com. Voice America is where you are and where you want to be. Join us around the globe as we broadcast live from some of the most interesting events available. Don't forget to view all our live events, including on-demand access to past events that you may have missed by visiting voiceamerica.com forward slash live events. Now you don't have to stay linked to your desktop or laptop. Take Voice America on the go and listen anywhere. Get our mobile app for iPhone, BlackBerry, or Android at the Apple iTunes App Store, BlackBerry App World, or Android Market. We don't follow. We lead. Join us. The Voice America Influencers Channel. You're listening to The Spotlight with Tony D'Urso. We'd love to hear from you via email. Be sure to send questions and comments to Tony at TonyDurso.com. Now, back to The Spotlight. All right, we're back with Tony D'Urso on The Spotlight. As you heard, I'm on television with the Tony D'Urso TV show. Check it out at TonyDurso.com slash Tony TV. I'd love to hear how you like it. And if you want to get on my show, fill out the form at Tony, D-U-R-S-O.com slash Tony TV. Today's show is with Levi King, co-founder and CEO of NAV. Raised on a farm in rural Idaho, Levi is a self-taught serial entrepreneur who has started business in the manufacturing, franchising, retail, tech verticals, and he invested in many more. All right. And now back to the chat with Levi. Levi, is this for businesses that only have an EIN? What about sole proprietors that use a social? No, we, we have tens of thousands of sole proprietor customers. It, it applies equally to both. If you're a sole proprietor and your DBA or ABN is your own name, so let's say I'm Max Smith and I'm, a, I'm an independent drywall guy, contractor, I don't have any employees, and my business is I'm I'm Max Smith doing business as Max Smith. If you if you're accessing credit, you'll have a, a Dun & Bradstreet business credit report on your personal name because you are one and the same as a business entity. So sole props get the same value from our product as folks with employees that have incorporated or formed an LLC. Now, based on the data, we may recommend they form an LLC. The stage of life liability there there's reasons why we may recommend that or just a, a legal entity. We don't choose what type or recommend what type that'd be crossing a line, but we encourage them to gain education. See, is it time to do that and put the, the business's credit on the business and make the business stand on, on its own two feet. Now, Levi, correct me if I'm in error here, but to get on Dun and Bradstreet, don't you need an EIN instead of just having a social as a sole proprietor? Uh, you need a, uh, you know, that it's interesting you asked me a question that I'm not confident in the answer. So congratulations, and I'm not embarrassed, but That's okay. uh, I believe a sole proprietor, I believe a sole proprietor can. Um, it, it, getting a DUNS number, there's other requirements, um, but that's a, that's a good question. Okay, well, let's, let's flip it around the other way. In order to be in Dun & Bradstreet, you get a DUNS number, whatever that process is. That makes sense? Yeah, they, they'll, yes, they'll verify that you're a legitimate business. So meaning... Uh, address, phone number, kind of the business identity, um, secretary of state, because even if you're a sole prop, there's, 
you you had to have filed an ABN or a um, a suit business name or shoot DBA, depending on the state you're in, they call them different things. And so there is a public record that you are in business as an individual. And so they need to connect all those dots in order to form a Dunn's num to issue a Dunn's number. And then it takes a few trade lines in a few months at least to get an actual Dunn's uh, or Paydex score. Okay, good. And I'm just drilling down this for all the solopreneurs and small business owners that use their own name and their own social to find out if you qualify for any kind of funding, you need a D and B number and you can apply there, use your social, but fill out the form and go through that little process, including getting some trade credit. Does that make sense so far? Am I saying it right? Yes, for trade credit, that's correct. Now, if you're getting a business credit card or a business loan or other types of finding, it's a, it's a little more complex than just a, a paydex score, but there's there's all kinds of trade credit that you can get on a, on the back of a very strong Dun & Bradstreet file and paydex score, whether it's your steel supplier, Home Depot, I mentioned Dell Computer, Dell issues credit to small businesses with a strong paydex and file in, in that alone. Just if the DMB is strong enough, they'll they'll issue credit against that, and that's actually a, a much bigger ecosystem as far as the total dollars of credit extended than actual small business lending. Small business lending is about a trillion dollar ecosystem in the U.S., and it's a the estimates on trade credit are that there's four to five trillion in business to business credit issued each year. I got you, Levi. So just following that line for the small business owners that have not applied with DNB to get that DNB number, they wouldn't necessarily be able to use your system? No, they can still use the system. We would just recommend that they they file they can file for a DUNS number right through our product without even leaving. And it, it's actually the only place you can file for a DUNS number that isn't directly with Dun & Bradstreet. So no, we, we still, if they want to be a, stay a sole prop and not have a DUNS number, they can, there, there's still plenty that they can do. And we have thousands of customers that are in that camp. Nope, I'm good. I don't, the DUNS number is not relevant to my industry. Um, not worried about it. Don't need trade credit, but I need a, a business credit card or, you know, some other type of financing or credit. Levi, you've just made getting business credit so easy and so simple. This is really cool because it's it's whatever level the person needs. If they don't need to go there, they don't have to. And your system will still tell them their odds or of success of getting for whatever that loan or credit card or whatever they may need. Correct. And we, we have a feature called Match Factor that exposes to them where they're off. And that comes to the, the transparency, which is part of our vision and mission. So if we're telling you you have a 30% chance of being approved, you can click on Match Factor and see where you're off. And then you can get to work on that stuff. So we bring the transparency, bring the confidence, um, bring the recommendations. And, and the way that it actually works is, you know, we like to joke here that small businesses are all snowflakes. They're all different, which makes it very difficult to build for small business. Whereas if you're building a credit product for consumers, we, we look a lot more alike as consumers than we do small businesses. And so we, it starts with the data layer. So we know industry, time of business, credit quality, there's geography, all these factors that we know, right? The second they sign up, and then our software is dynamic and it wraps around that data and the content is dynamic. So if you sign up and you're a plumber, we know you're a plumber. We know you got three years in business. And so we're, that's how we're speaking to you. And it's, all, it's almost like robo-advising for small business. But that's why it works for a sole prop, someone with five full-service restaurants that's 20 years in business, because it, it's dynamic. The software and the content and the communication outside of the product are always dynamic to the data that we sit on. I got you. And I'll get... I, as the small business, business person, company, whatever, will get in a percentage, reply for a loan, I'm just going to make this up, $10,000 line of credit, will get a percentage back that says, this is your odds of getting this because based on the people you have or the companies you have, the lenders that you have, that would finance something. So far, so good? Yeah, so far, so good. It's based on your actual data, which is contextual, but it's also based on lookalikes. We've already seen lots of people just like you over the life of our business try the same thing with the same lender for the same amount. And so it's, it looks at you in isolation, but also you against anonymous lookalikes, obviously. You would never see any of those other folks. And the kind of information that you want, first of all, there's 
information that we as a business owner share to the public. They, they know our name, they know our phone number, our email, they know our address. That's fine. What private information do you obtain? You obtain the social and or the EIN and any other private information? We, in order to pull in the consumer credit data, we need the social, the date of birth, the address, and the name, which is highly sensitive and, and protected under law, uh, the step PI information. Then the business name and the, the zip code, there's, because the Fair Credit Reporting Act doesn't protect small business, anyone can check any, any other small business's credit at any time for any reason, and they won't even know about it. So we just need the business name and zip. The EIN is not involved. That's not part of the data hierarchy at the credit bureaus. So it's just business name and zip. And if we don't get a match or we're not confident, then we may ask for like the street or a couple other details, but it's always related to the name and address, not to the EIN number. And then the business checking account, it's username, password, authenticate, just like you probably used Mint or lots of other PFM tools. It's a similar process. It only takes a few minutes, but the data we bring in is very rich. And so, I'm sure you can imagine um, there's people hesitate to give anyone their social security number. So that's some of the reasons why we took uh, an investment from Experian. We took one from Goldman Sachs. We've brought on very reputable investors that have already built a brand. But also when people see you're partnered with American Express and Capital One and Chase and all these other big brands, they we actually have pretty high conversion, but it's people trust us. They, they have to cross the line and say, we trust you. And if you're inside of the business, there's all kinds of compliance that we follow as a result. There's a heightened security area. If you're working, you talk to customers on the phone, you leave your phone, your personal phone in a locker. There's no pens or paper allowed in the heightened security area. There's cameras in there. We, you, you can't work at our company anywhere without a drug test, background check, and a credit check. If your credit's not good enough, we can't hire you. We, we treat data and security compliance as um, like a lot of companies will complain about it, we view it as a privilege to have access to that people trust us with their data. My co-founder is an attorney, and so he oversees all of our legal and compliance. And it's uh, it, it impacts every area area of our business, legal and compliance, so that we can protect our customers. Very glad to hear about the security and the precautions you take and how you work inside the company. Now, just about everyone listening to this is no stranger to when they give out their social security number to apply for a credit card or anything, they get a ding, not a ding, they get a ping or whatever it is, it's not the right wording, on their credit report. Now, the EIN, that's separate because that's the business credit reporting. That doesn't affect us. But for the sole proprietors where we use our social, that can impact us personally. So when we apply through NAV to get a loan and we're, we are a sole proprietor, does your system make that mark against applying for a loan, whatever the wording is, excuse me, it registers and I'm just not thinking of what that nomenclature is. Yeah, so the terminology is hard inquiry, which lowers your score, or a soft inquiry, which has no impact. Um, so we do not do hard inquiries, it's all soft inquiries. And, and that's under the FCRA, the purpose for which we pull your credit is to show it to you and to, to pre-qualify you for offers, which means that it is not a hard inquiry under the Fair Credit Reporting Act. So there's no, no damage to your credit in using our product. This is the Spotlight with Tony D'Urso. Just ahead, we're going to find out more from Levi King, co-founder and CEO of NAV. But first, it's time for us to take a short break. See you back here in just a moment. Change starts here. Change starts now. Join us, the Voice America Influencers Channel. You heard that a majority of businesses fail. Don't be a statistic. Get my book free, The Vision Map. Beat the odds for your business success. Get it free at TonyDURSO.com slash vision. And set up your own successful vision map. TonyDURSO.com slash vision. Are you ready for provocative discussions with some of today's most powerful movers and shakers? Tune in to The Art of Significance, featuring Dan Clark, the modern-day Napoleon Hill, who interviews the wealthiest, most successful celebrities and business leaders on the planet who are using their influence to change the world. From authors to entertainers, sports figures, educators to military leaders, Dan covers multiple topics. 
Tune in every Monday at noon Pacific, 3 p.m. Eastern on the Voice America Influencers Channel. More people are in slavery today than ever before. With Rock Against Trafficking, our goal is to create awareness through the power of music. Join host Gary Miller, an award-winning songwriter, musician, and producer, as he connects with the musicians that are part of the effort, showcases new music, and brings stories that will reach out to you in supporting the survivors of trafficking. Listen in every Thursday at 12 noon Pacific Time, 3 p.m. Eastern, for Rock Against Trafficking on the Voice America Influencers Channel. The future of online TV is here. View exclusive content from your favorite talk radio hosts and new programs that you can't see anywhere else. Visit voiceamerica.tv today. Hear the stories. Be motivated. Be inspired. Join us today. Voice America Influencers. You're listening to The Spotlight with Tony D'Urso. We'd love to hear from you via email. Be sure to send questions and comments to Tony at TonyDurso.com. Now, back to The Spotlight. All right, we're back with Tony D'Urso on The Spotlight. Today's show is with Levi King, co-founder and CEO of NAV. Prior to starting NAV, Levi co-founded Lendio, an online business financing matchmaker that helped over 1 million businesses search for funding. All right, back to the chat with Levi. One little credit tidbit about personal credit that a lot of people must understand is, you know, they're used to shopping for an auto loan or a mortgage. That's really common. If you get five inquiries in a 45-day period that are mortgage inquiries, you're, the FICO scoring model treats that as one inquiry because it knows you're shopping, and you're, but you're not going to buy five houses. You're not going to leverage yourself. If you're buying an auto or if you're getting an auto loan within a 30 day period, 10, 20, doesn't matter how many inquiries, it's treated as one inquiry as far as the impact to your personal credit score on, under the FICO scoring model. However, credit cards, whether personal or business, every inquiry is a one to one match and business loans and personal loans. And so people that shop for a credit card or a loan can really clobber their credit because every single one uh, hits their credit and it's an indication of risk. Like it could be someone's desperate and they're trying to accumulate credit anywhere and everywhere they can. That's one of the reasons that it lowers the score. So hence back to one of your earlier questions, you got to know before you apply. That's why in the consumer space, there's great companies like Credit Karma. Experian has a great uh, product for free that includes your FICO score, whereas everybody else has um, Vantage scores. There's Credit Sesame is a great company. So there's lots of places you can go now as a consumer and make sure you don't get pummeled with all these different inquiries. All right. And I like the fact that it's a soft inquiry, and I appreciate you refreshing me on the nomenclature on that. All right. Very cool. Okay, you heard that, the Spotlight audience. All you business people out there, if you need some expansion money, you want to grow your business, you want to do something that you probably haven't thought of before, I recommend checking out nav.com. It sounds really cool. It looks good and it's simple. And it's just something that I've learned here. Normal business lending services just don't seem to have that. What is it? The software, the environment? I don't know. how. Maybe Levi, you could explain. What is it? If you, if you had to sum it up, what is it that makes you so different and successful than the normal, traditional business lending services out there? Yeah, so, so first of all, we would never even describe ourselves as a business lending service. We, we describe ourselves as credit financial education for small business. Lending bec- becomes attached to that only as a consequence of you now understand all of your, the data that impacts you, you work on it, you prove it, you track it. That's the business we're in is education. The benefit of being in that business is we'll make money if you go successfully get a business credit card with one of our partners. So, but what makes us different is, is, is we are credit financial education. We'll tell you not to apply for stuff. If the, the match factor is too low, we won't let you apply because we know it's bad for you. If, we, if you're qualified for a subprime card and a prime card, we won't let you apply for the subprime card. And you can click on why. They'll tell you, because get this one. You're, you're better than that. And so that there's not really a good direct competitor to us. If, you, if a small business owner wanted to get the value we have to offer, they got to go to Credit Karma, Experian, Credit Sesame, someone like that to understand their consumer data, but they're going to be talked to as a consumer. And there's different advice for a small business as it relates to consumer credit. Then you got to go to Dun & Bradstreet, and Experian, the Business Credit Bureau, different format, different scores. You're trying to understand all this. 
no one's going to help you understand your business. Checking data, you got to somehow cobble it all together and then predict where it is you need to go. So there's, there's really not any good direct comparison to what we do today, which um, is, is a nice to have and we don't expect will be the case forever. You know, I really like that, that your system will actually communicate back, say, nah, you don't really want this loan. It's not right for you. <laughs> it's so different. Yeah, our, our ranking algorithm is agnostic to how much we get paid. In fact, we, we send thousands of customers out every single month to get credit where we actually don't get paid. So we, we send folks out to get business credit cards, to get credit with Quill, Office Depot, lots of these B2B credit sources. We don't get paid, I don't think, by any of them. I check with our account management team. So, so for us, we, it's more about winning the trust. So if, if we make the right recommendation, even if we don't get paid as much or we make nothing, well, they're going to trust us the next time around because they know that, that we're, we're doing what's right for them. And so it's a, it's a lifetime value investment in the customer um, that we think will, will fare better over time. But our, the algorithm ranks by um, cost is always first because obviously we hope they get the lowest cost financing and then certainty, cost and certainty kind of mix. And then they can shake it up. If, they, if speed is what matters most, not cost, well, then it's usually going to be a more costly option because the fast folks are going to charge more. But that, that's not going to ever be the default that we show them. That is quite something. And that is a testament right there to your incredible growth just shooting way up there. The way you operate and take care of people, it is just so different and refreshing in this day and age. I'd like to know now you've helped so many. I believe you've got some really great successes there of businesses and people that you've helped. Can you share some with us? Yeah, you bet. And, and the customer empathy around these stories really is comes from me and my co-founder, our experience running small businesses. I, we both, I had about 30 different commercial instruments I was approved for over time, not counting trade credit, to SBA loans, equipment lease, equipment financing, inventory financing, um, real, real, commercial real estate, all kinds of loans. My co-founder had two small businesses previously, both law firms, and he accessed all types of financing. So there's that, that customer empathy is where it all starts. But we just, we see, we have hundreds and or thousands of customer testimonials all the time on, and, and it's a really never stops surprising me. So in your, in your head, when you think about our model, a lot, a lot of people might think, oh, it's probably for earlier companies, you know, the ones that haven't really figured it out yet. But we had a customer just recently, 21 years in business, as a wholesale uh, beauty supply company, 21 years in business, had never seen their business credit, had never been able to get, uh, successfully get great financing, signs up for NAV. They wanted to move in, start an online presence and start to sell online, needed a loan, this lady. And she signs up for NAV and she has like an erroneous tax lien, uh, UCC filing that had expired but never fell off, a, a collection of issues that just accumulated over the years. And she was able to take care of all of them, took a few months, scores improved dramatically, and she got an SBA loan, which is kind of the holy grail of financing. It's insured by the federal government, and it's usually the lowest cost option out there. But you would think that 21 years in business, eventually you'd stub your toe somewhere that would lead you to go dig deeper, but it starts just in the line for So we have those types of examples. We also have newer businesses. I'll tell you a real story about myself. That In fact, last night I had dinner with the chairman and CEO of Dun & Bradstreet, and I told him this story just because this is how I learned about Dun & Bradstreet as a credit bureau. My first company, servicing electric signs the first year, very profitable, did well, got into manufacturing. I just scrappy, cold calling, scared me to death to call people. I'm an introvert, so that's learned behavior for me. And I'm getting these odd jobs, like this scraps falling off the table from the big guys. I got this conglomerate of car dealers, you know, they, they put get in the same geography with an auto mall, even though they're competitors, and they just, they're building a new location. And so I'd won their business on the service side and like the repairs and updates, but this was the first new manufacturing job, which is where a lot of the money is. So I knew the guy that was spearheading it for all of them. We had a good relationship. I put in my bid. It was like a quarter million dollar job or something like that. And with, for a small business with two and a half million in revenue, it's a big deal, this job. Plus it was kind of marquee. So then it would give me credibility to get into other big jobs. And I didn't get the job. And I knew I had, my price was like, 50000 better-ish. Yeah, I just knew I was had a way better price. 
the quality was spec, so my quality was going to be equal, and I didn't get the job. So I go over to this guy, I'm like 22, he's probably 60, and he didn't put his arm around me, but it was a put your arm around me moment, like philosophically, right? Pulls me over. I'm like, man, I, I've done this. I show up on the weekends at night because the signs burned out and you're trying to do a sale. Like, I've done all these things for you and I'm grateful for it, but what about the big job? Like, this could put me on the map. Then the arm around the shoulder moment is he pulls out the competitor's bid, the bid package. He opens it up and I could see right there on the left where, where the bid's always at. Indeed, I was tens of thousands of dollars cheaper, which is like I get the anger boiling up inside me. I'm kind of a hothead. And then he pulls something out from deeper in the stack. He pulls out my Dun & Bradstreet business credit report, which was hammered. And not because I was bad at my obligations, but because I acquired a company that had been in business 51 years. I didn't know anything about Dun & Bradstreet. I bought the assets of the company and the name, and then I attached that L or the, the DBA to my company because there was customer accounts that were still paying that name and such. And so then at the business bureau level, I got merged with this other company. And so I inherited the accumulated garbage of 51 years of someone that didn't care about their credit. And I, I, it blew my mind. I'm like, what, what in the heck is this business credit done at Bradstreet? And I lost a job over it? And that's how I learned about Dun & Bradstreet. So then I dug in. I was able to get it sorted out with Dun & Bradstreet. It was just automation of the merging of those names, how it all happened. Got it sorted out. I had to show them documentation to show that, indeed, I, I did not buy the, the legal entity, and that was not my garbage. And then that led to, oh, well, now I got this cleaned up. I could get credit with my steel supplier because as a manufacturer, I had steel supplier, paint supplier, plastic supplier, sign, specialty supplier, electrical supplier, concrete supplier for when we did pull signs. Uh, you get credit with the, the company that we leased crane, uh, boom trucks from. And so it got credit cleaned up and I was always dealing in cash before that, and, which is a major constraint obviously to growing in that type of business. And instead got credit with all my suppliers. And so that, the way that I learned about Dun & Bradstreet was incredibly painful. And it was kind of fun. I got to tell the, the CEO and chairman of Dun & Bradstreet that story last night. That is a phenomenal story. This is The Spotlight with Tony D'Urso. Just ahead, Levi shares more insights and his contact info. But first, it's time for us to take a short break. See you back here in just a moment. This is the Voice America Influencers Channel. Be inspired. Want to improve your health, business, and life just by listening to a radio show? Well, we can at least move you in the right direction. Listen for Spotlight, the Allison H. Larson Show. Each week, Allison will speak with amazing guests and find out what's changed their lives and how they are changing the lives of others. From beauty to health to business and personal relationships, we're here to inspire you to live your life of passion. Listen every Tuesday at 10 a.m. Pacific Time, 1 p.m. Eastern on the Voice America Influencers Channel channel. Do you believe that being fit is difficult? Do you think it requires turning in your favorite comfort foods for boring chicken and broccoli and spending hours in a gym? It doesn't. Tune into Have It All with Devin Alexander. Devin and her guest experts will show you how you can have it all at any age, from relationships to money to thinking bigger than you've ever imagined. Devin will fast track your goals to yummy reality. Tune in every Wednesday at 9 a.m. Pacific Time and 12 noon Eastern Time on the Voice America Influencers Channel. Have you had a chance to check out Voice America's online magazine and blog, Press Pass? If you love our hosts and shows, check out articles that give an even deeper perspective. Plus, topics about health and fitness, movie reviews, philosophy, business tips and tactics, spirituality, positive thought, current events, and even more about your favorite host. It's just a click away at VAPressPass.com. That's VAPressPass.com. VA Press Pass by Voice America. All access, all the time. We don't follow, we lead. Join us, the Voice America Influencers Channel. You're listening to The Spotlight with Tony D'Urso. We'd love to hear from you via email. Be sure to send questions and comments to Tony at TonyDurso.com. Now, back to The Spotlight. All right, we're back with Tony D'Urso on the Spotlight. As you heard, I'm on television with the Tony D'Urso TV show. Check it out at TonyDurso.com 
slash Tony TV. I'd love to hear how you like it. And if you want to get on my show, fill out the form at Tony, dot com slash Tony TV. Today's show is with Levi King, co-founder and CEO of NAV. NAV works with the U.S. Small Business Administration and local small business development centers to host educational presentations, webinars, and more. And now, back to the chat. Like you, I am a fellow alumni in going through the School of Hard Knocks in my world of lead generation, marketing, and so forth. And you've learned so much, that, and you're so successful, and you've been through the pain. I'd like to know for our audience if there are any particular lessons or additional lessons that you can share with our audience on this. Yeah, I'm glad you asked that because like my, my biggest piece of advice to other CEOs or founders is be authentic to the point of consistent vulnerability. And I feel like what I'm not telling you is all the stupid things that I've done and mistakes that I've made when I thought I was right and all the failings to get to where I'm at, which would be an inauthentic story if those, those things weren't shared. But I guess the, the best qualities I have are just being relentless and like crazy curious and dissatisfied with answers. You know, so like the Dun & Bradstreet thing, I could have rolled over where I could figure that whole web out. And, you know, later I would have a similar experience in how I learned that uh, Experian had a business credit bureau when I was turned down by, I think it was U.S. Bank for a merchant processing account. So I had to go to a subprime and get a subprime discount rate. And I'm raising hell with U.S. Bank. I finally get to the underwriter because I got a letter in the mail that said it was due to my Experian credit. And by then I knew, understood consumer credit. My credit was perfect. And I'm arguing with this underwriter. And I'm like, what is it about the credit? And finally, they're like, oh, you're, you're thinking it's personal credit. No, it's business credit. But it didn't say that anywhere on the letter. And so that's how I found out there was a bureau. So went through that pain and then learned about the whole, the whole web and universe that they've played a part of. But, you know, I, the biggest mistakes I've made along the way, one is, the first is I was probably worst in class leader and manager for the first couple of businesses I did, but fancied myself to be a good leader. Worst in class communicator, but fancied myself to be an excellent communicator and went through some really painful experiences to, that helped me see myself as others saw me. And I can tell you, that, I can tell you it's a brutal story, but it's one of the most, probably top five most important things that have ever happened to me as, a, as an entrepreneur. But people mistakes are the biggest mistakes that I've made along the way. And it's my personality. I'm, I'm wired very left brain, um, except I'm not shy. So I open my fat mouth and screw up all the time. And I'm a lot better now, but it, it took me over a decade of leading and managing people to properly express what's in my heart and mind um, because I wasn't a bad guy, but I sure as heck was coming across like one. That's very touching, and I totally understand, and, and I am totally with you on that. People are so important. Sometimes in a rush, in quick action to get some work done, we may ignore someone, and if we do, we ignore them or treat them incorrectly at our peril because every single person is so very important whether we realize it or not, they're just important to our life, our personal relation, our business, our livelihood. It's quite amazing. That is really a great lesson. I don't hear enough people talk about that out of all the hundreds of interviews I've done. People are just so important. And it shows and comes through your authenticity in this interview and in knowing about you and where you've come from. You have that mentality. A person is a person. They're not they're not a machine. They're not a number. They're not an object or anything. And I think, I really think that is one of the keys to your success. Thank you. Sure. And Levi, you are a serial entrepreneur, very successful with multiple businesses. Do you have any classes or books or anything coming down the pike for those that want to start and improve and grow their own business? You've got a lot of lessons there you could teach us. Do you have anything coming in the future on that? Uh, I, put, I actually put out a lot of content, as you referenced early on. I, I, I collaborate with a writer. Um, back to the authenticity thing, I, I refuse to put anything out that, you know, a quote that I wouldn't actually quote or a book that I haven't actually read. So the content that I put out is very authentic. I, I tried to work with a couple writers to do the heavy lifting, you know, inter interview me on a topic. I, I give the bullet points. They flesh out the rest. And it, it just didn't, wasn't quite my voice. 
And so I ended up collaborating with my first cousin, one of my best friends growing up, three months apart in age, both have a sick, dark sense of humor, you know, and, and he and I started to collaborate and it's been a great partnership for a few years. So he's behind the scenes doing the heavy lifting. And then of course, I'm always doing the final edit and just making sure there's nothing off, but he can get in my head. So that, that really is kind of a good shortcut to getting a lot of authentic uh, stuff out. The, what I learned through, you know, the, I mentioned earlier, kind of the school of hard knocks. I also, when I, when I left college to start my first business, I had it in my head that, oh, I'm, I'm getting a business degree. They're going to teach me how to run a business, which now I realize wouldn't really have been the case. But at the time, I didn't know that. And growing up, we didn't get to watch much TV. I lived on a farm. I read books all the time. Of course, it was fiction. Every book I could get my hands on, I would devour. So I remember so desperate one time to find something to read. I got one of my sister's books. You know, I'm like 10 or 11, and I'm reading a book about teenage girls, and I just felt ashamed. Like, I shouldn't read this. There's nothing weird in it. It's just in my head. It was weird for a boy to read a girl book, but I was so desperate to have something to read. And so when I left college, I, I said, okay, I'm only going to read nonfiction. And I've devoured thousands of books, but I, I – I think this is a mistake I made in my career, is I thought, ah, I don't need to find mentors. I'm going to read from the greats. So I've read tons of corporate biographies and of the founders of those companies. And you can always learn a lot of good stuff for, from any of them, regardless of what business you're in. You know, you, you, you take out the pieces that apply, but none of it's adaptable and none of it's contextual for the real time. And I don't believe in playbooks for success. I, I, I hate when people pitch playbooks. I think there's a lot of people that have been successful. They, oh, here's how I did it. It's a playbook. But success is always so highly dynamic. There's luck involved. It's the people. There's the economy. There's the vertical. There's all these highly complex components. So I hesitate to, I will not recommend a playbook. But for me, the most valuable books for me in business, you know, some of the classics, like my very first business, I was fortunate I read e which helps a small business owner transcend from a person with a trade as an individual into an actual business with systems and, a, and process. You know, when you start a business, you don't go, oh, I'm also a bill collector and a salesperson, an estimator, right? You don't, you don't realize what you're getting into. And that's why so many small businesses can't take it to the next level. That was great foundational, you know, the new positioning, like how do you position as a small business? Um, so there's lots of those that were really kind of foundational initially. Then there was the pain... Ten years later, when I got, I had another business outsourced sales and marketing company, employed a bunch of people. My my business partner was my brother-in-law, close friend. He's an extrovert. I'm an introvert. We didn't know that about ourselves or what those words were at the time. Uh, I flew to Cleveland and fired someone because I didn't show up for work. It was somebody that he hired, and I didn't get his permission or even talk to him about it. Turned into this argument back in Denver at our office about who's the better leader, and. You know, I was just, I would have bet every dime that I had and didn't have that I was, I was right. So we did it, this guy that we contracted with, we knew and trusted, we're like, hey, Rich, what do we do? How do we settle this? And he's like, do an anonymous 360 survey. So we pushed this thing out and asked like 100 questions. It's all anonymous. It goes out to like, I don't know, 80 people or something. Many of whom which are friends of mine who I would like consider a friend. And we get it back, and, and you rate yourself, right? So the 360 is we had him rate, rate, fill it out as if he was our boss, this guy that was helping us out, and then peers, and then each other, rate yourself, and then your direct reports. And, you know, it's like, Levi, how well do you communicate in these five categories? And in my head, I'm thinking, you know what? I'm probably a 10, but I'll be humble and put nine. Uh, probably a 10, maybe I'll, I'll go eight. There's got to be room for improvement. So I fill this thing out, certain I'm going to be vindicated. Results come in brutal. I'm saying I'm a nine on communication. It's like a two on average. Like you got to get a lot of ones to get two on average. And then the comments were just hard. And I went through this process uh, for a few days of turmoil. And guess what? I guess what my my takeaway was. They're all stupid. This just oh, shows no. why I'm in charge. Because <laughs> they're all too dumb to be in charge. So I am. That's human nature. That's what I wanted to believe. And after about a week of just torment over this, I just had a, a moment of truth and moment of clarity. And I realized if I don't take this and change, this is the best I'll ever be. And I'm 26 years old. Do I really want to peak at age 26? And it was just a, so I sent an email, the whole thing, let everybody see the results. I 
apologized to my brother-in-law. And there was other things that it wasn't like I was crappy at everything. There was other things, you know, like strategy and confidence, at, at, you know, at the helm and things. So it was basically like, hey, we think this guy's smart. We like, we trust working for him, but he's an asshole, so don't talk to me. <laughs> it's just <laughs> terrible. So, you know, I made it transparent, and I, I bought some books, Crucial Conversations, The Color Code. That's where I went on this journey of learning and understanding personality types. And now someone reports to me, they take the, the personality test. We see how to communicate with each other. Um, so that was like the next phase of my life was understanding people and myself. So I read First Break All the Rules is an amazing book. Um, that really helped me embrace the fact that I'm, it's okay to be shitty at a lot of things, but I should be honest with the people around me and ask their permission to be shitty at certain things and give them permission to be shitty at the things that are not, their brain isn't wired for either. That was a very foundational book for me at that, that phase of my career. And then I, I, the next phase is just really getting into brain science. I, it's just a topic that fascinates me, but if you understand how people think, it can bleed into everything in a positive way, whether it's marketing, product, uh, negotiation, negotiating, selling, and and so there's there's lots of good books there uh, as well that I could recommend. But um, yeah, it's just different phases of my career with different topics. There was a time I did really nerded out on economics, uh, really nerded out on management, and powered through Peter Drucker, the most boring writer in the world, some of his stuff, but. Just always on this endless journey of of learning and understanding. That is extremely insightful, and I just thank you so much for sharing all that. Lots of nuggets here, lots of information. The spotlight audience, rewind and write these books down. Check it out. This is really the stuff. In you have to, you know, have that introspective moment and be willing to be better and not think that you know it all. I think that is just so important there and. The fact that you were willing to just bury your chest and take a look and just be open and honest and straight helped you elevate to such a higher and higher level. Really appreciate that. That is just so cool. Thank you. And before we go, we want to make sure if anyone wants to get a hold of you, is there any contact information you'd like to provide for our audience? Sure. My email address is one of the shortest ones you'll ever email. It's LK. My initials, Levi King, LK at nab, N-A-B dot com. Okay. And for someone to apply and find out more about the process, they just go to navnav.com. Anything particular that people, new people should look for or navigate towards? Just the sign up button and go through the flow. All right. You heard that, the Spotlight audience. For anyone that wants, okay, so this is not just for business. This is for learning credit, understanding, financing, and your options. And help me along, Levi. Anything else that we can summarize for the audience, why they should go to your site. Understand basically any type of commercial or small business financing. Understand your personal credit as a small business owner, your business credit, your checking data, and and how to improve and protect and take advantage of those things over the life of your business. Beautiful, succinct. All right, well, such an amazing interview with Levi King, co-founder and CEO of NAB. Thank you so much for sharing this all with us, Levi. Love it, love it, love it. Thank you. (laughs) Yeah, great privilege. I think I know a lot, but I've learned so much more, and it just shows how much more there is still to learn in the world of finance, credit, and everything. Just great. I can't get enough of this stuff, it seems. And to our Spotlight audience, thank you. It's our honor to have you listen. All right. Keep your focus on success, and we'll see you next on the Spotlight. We hope you've enjoyed this week's edition of The Spotlight with Tony D'Urso. Be sure to tune in again next Friday at 4 p.m. Eastern Time, 1 p.m. Pacific Time on the Voice America Influencers Channel. Now, enjoy the weekend.